Welcome back to another installment of Space This Week, and there's a lot to discuss about the past week of spaceflight, let me tell you. It's likely that the Flight 4 wet dress rehearsal that we saw last week wasn't a full success, as SpaceX appeared to be readying for another one ahead of Flight 4's launch. We also saw the first of six dedicated launches of SpaceX's Star Shield satellites for the National Reconnaissance Office, 46 more Starlink satellites made it to orbit, Electron conducted the first of two launches for NASA's pre-fire mission, and the UK got one major step closer towards its first vertical rocket launch. There was a massive failure during a test of a Starship Raptor engine and during a launch attempt from North Korea. All of this and so much more, so sit back and enjoy. So yes, wet dress rehearsal for Flight 4. SpaceX conducted this critical pre-launch test on the 20th of May, same day as last week's episode of Space This Week in fact, and it seemed to go well. If you don't already know, a wet dress rehearsal is basically a simulated launch, where the rocket and ground systems go through all the steps for a real-life launch, from loading of real propellants to firing up all the flight control systems, etc, etc, doing everything required for launch, but ignition itself doesn't happen. Now, last Monday's test did seem to go pretty well. The rocket was filled in a staggering just 40 minutes, and then everything was detanked afterwards, with no mention of any shortcomings on social media. However, one glaring detail we noticed was a lack of activation of FireX, the fire suppression system on the orbital launch mount, and the activation of the water deluge system, which were both used in the wet dress rehearsal for Flight 3. Therefore, it was speculated that the test was aborted, and that another one would need to take place before before Flight 4 could go for launch. Anyway, early in the week, Ship 29 was de-stacked from Booster 11 and placed alongside it. Crews were then seen inspecting its heat shield tiles, as well as installing new ones that hadn't yet been attached. The fact that the ship wasn't moved back to the production facility for any of this implied that another full stack was expected soon. And now, that's just happened! In the early hours of today, Ship 29 was restacked on Booster 11. Some people took this as a sign that SpaceX are now ready for launch, especially given the recent tweets from both Elon Musk and SpaceX that launch is now very soon, but this is not the final stack. Ship 29 still has not had all of its tiles installed, and crucially, neither vehicle has had its flight termination system installed. This is always the very last thing that gets added prior to a launch. So, if this stack isn't for launch, then what's it for? Well, it's likely to repeat the wet dress rehearsal. There are road closures in place from tomorrow, the 29th and 30th, for a wet dress rehearsal, so expect it in the first half of the week, and if successful, then D-Stack will happen for termination system explosives to be installed, restack, and then launch. Right now, SpaceX's official line is that this will be no earlier than the 5th of June, so mark your calendars. Elsewhere in Starbase, the former suborbital launch pad site continues to be raised as SpaceX prepares to begin construction of Orbital Launch Pad 2. We now have several tower segments on site, ready to go vertical once the groundwork is complete. We also saw the continued removal of the defunct vertical GSE tanks. Remember Flight 3? Well, we have some new insight into how the Flight 3 Super Heavy failed to soft land in the ocean. It hit the water at unsurvivable speeds, despite an otherwise successful flight. SpaceX have now released an official explanation behind this blip. Following stage separation, the booster initiated its 13-engine boost back burn, which started well, but then six engines prematurely shut down, resulting in an incomplete boost back. Unfortunately, those six shutdown engines would have been needed for the final landing burn, which requires the same 13 engines as the boost back. And so, there were now only seven engines for the landing burn, and only two successfully reached main stage ignition. SpaceX's leading theory for the engine shutdowns is continued filter blockage of the liquid oxygen supply, leading to loss of inlet pressure in the engine turbo pumps. This also happened during the Flight 2 test, so it would seem that this is a recurring problem for Super Heavy. SpaceX have stated that Flight 4's Super Heavy has received additional hardware inside its oxygen tanks to improve propellant filtration, and hardware and software changes have been implemented to improve the startup reliability of Raptor during landing. 
One such change to Flight Force Super Heavy will be the jettisoning of its hot stage ring, which is a separate detachable piece from the main booster. I know this means that in this form, Starship is no longer a fully reusable vehicle, but this will only be a temporary thing while the rocket is still in development. I imagine that the hot stage ring will be preserved once we see the Block 2 Starships enter testing. SpaceX's report also included the likely root cause for Ship 28's uncontrolled spin during re-entry. It was due to clogging of the valves responsible for roll control, and that additional roll control thrusters will be added on upcoming Starships to improve attitude control redundancy, as well as upgraded hardware to reduce the risk of blockage in the first place. Now it's unclear if Ship 29 will have received any of these hardware improvements, so we'll just have to wait and see how successful its re-entry is once it launches. Another Starship failure we saw was at the McGregor test site. SpaceX conducted a hot fire test of a Raptor engine in the test stand when... Boom. That's a... That's a pretty catastrophic failure right there. Now, this could well have been intentional. It's pretty common to test space hardware to the point of failure so that we know the upper limits and can implement good safety thresholds during operation. This may well have been a Raptor V3 prototype, which SpaceX want to get even more performance out of than the current Raptor 2. Either that or something just went very, very wrong during this test. It's, it's impossible to say for sure. Luckily, there were no failures for SpaceX's Enrol 146 mission. This was last Wednesday and saw a Falcon 9 launch from a very, very foggy Vandenberg carrying 20 Star Shield satellites to orbit. We think. This was a classified mission and we don't actually know the exact number, but astronomer Jonathan McDowell shared that based on gaps in the catalog, 21 catalog numbers were reserved this mission, meaning it carried 21 satellites in total, or 20 plus a hardware adapter if required for the Starshield satellites. And speaking of Starshield, very little is known about the satellites themselves. They're built by SpaceX with collaboration from Northrop Grumman, and while they are very similar in function to Starlink, they also have additional functions relating to target tracking, optical and radio reconnaissance, and early missile warning. Last week's launch was the first of six dedicated launches to build out the Starshield network, which so far has only had a handful of test satellites launched for it. This is the first major launch to get it operational. Starshield's little brother, Starlink, wasn't neglected last week though. Across two Falcon 9 launches on Thursday and Friday, SpaceX grew the constellation out by another 46 Starlink satellites, and both Falcon 9s made successful landings on their ocean drone ships. Another cool Starlink achievement last week was this. This is the very first video call made using direct-to-cell satellites. These phones are communicating by directly connecting to the Starlink network without any ground infrastructure at all. SpaceX wasn't the only company launching stuff last week. Rocket Lab conducted their Ready, Aim, Pre-Fire launch on Saturday. The Electron rocket carried the first of two satellites for NASA's pre-fire mission to a 525km circular Earth orbit. Pre-fire stands for Polar Radiant Energy in the Far Infrared Experiment, and the two satellites will work together to measure a little studied portion of the radiant energy emitted by Earth, for clues about sea ice loss, ice sheet melting, and the warming of the Arctic. The satellites will crisscross over the Arctic and Antarctic, measuring thermal infrared radiation. The launch date of the second mission, named Pre-fire and Ice, will take place within around three weeks. North Korea had a go at launching something last week, with slightly less successful results. The launch was earlier today, actually, and was North Korea's Cholima-1 vehicle, carrying a spy satellite on board. This footage was filmed by the Japanese Broadcasting Network and appears to show what looks like an initially successful launch, with the rocket then veering off course, probably due to an engine failure, followed by failure of the fuselage and subsequent rud. And given that it's North Korea, that's about all we'll probably ever know about this launch. <laughs> Asia did see a successful launch from China though. Last Tuesday, a Kwaizu 11 carried four satellites to low Earth orbit. The main payload was the Wuhan 1 satellite, an Earth observation satellite built by Wuhan University, and three smaller payloads described as being ultra-low orbit technology experimental satellites. This was only the second successful launch of the Kwaizu 11, a rocket developed by X-Space Technology Corporation, which is a subsidiary of the China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation. 
Now, as a dweller of the British Isles, it's always bothered me that we are the only nation to successfully develop an orbital class rocket, only to then completely discontinue operating any orbital rocket ever again. The only way to see the Black Arrow now is in a museum. Here's me visiting said museum. And, you know, while this is very impressive, I I'd much rather see it fly. Well, that ain't gonna happen, but Rocket Factory Augsburg's RFA-1 will. Now, obviously, that's not a British rocket, but it will launch on the British Isles, namely Shetland, at the Saxevoord Space Centre. We've never actually had a vertical orbital rocket launch in the UK before, so this is very exciting for me. And just five weeks after its arrival, RFA has completed its first hot fire of its first stage with four Helix engines, captured here in this official video of the spectacular scene. All the best of luck to Rocket Factory to get this thing launching. I am definitely going to have to make the trip up to Shetland at some point to watch this and hopefully capture some footage to show you all in space this week. So, you know, hit subscribe so that you don't miss that one. Now, the fate of KSP-2 continues to look bleak as the communications blackout from Take-Two Interactive continues. And so last Saturday, Loud Aerospace was back in business in Kerbal Space Program 1. And given that they used to build a lot of SSTOs in that game, I figured the best way to return to form in the now only Kerbal game in my eyes would be to do just that. I really like how the vehicle ended up looking actually, so if you haven't seen the video yet, do check it out, it should now be one of the on-screen cards. Also, if you enjoy my content and want to help support it, then I do have a Patreon and YouTube member page that you can join, just like the beautiful people on the left did. But that's all from me today, I really hope you enjoyed today's episode of Space This Week, and I will catch you in the next video. Which will be on Saturday, I don't know what it's going to be yet, but it, it'll be 